Good morning. Great to have you with us. Let's stand, let's sing, let's worship together. Here we go.
do another song of praise right here. This one's going to be new to you, but it's super easy to catch on to. And it's just a, a great way of just expressing uh, our love for God and who He is. Let's sing this one.
what you came in here today with, what kind of baggage you brought with you, but uh, it's our opportunity to uh, cry out to him. And that's what worship's all about. Hey, good morning. Great to see you guys. Hey, listen, you just got some cards uh, handed to you by your section leader. Uh, these cards are uh, what we call our faith promise cards. Let me explain this briefly to you. And, and this is Matt Ali, by the way, and I want Matt to share with you just a moment a little of his testimony. Uh, but what we have been going through with faith promise over the last a uh, few weeks, and, and we do this every year here at New Hope, is we draw our focus, our attention towards missions. And we've talked about this a little bit, how we as a church uh, physically only have a, a small impact right here in this community, and sometimes it's hard for us to have an impact in other parts, even here in Montgomery County, but around the state and around the world. And so part of what we want to do is we want to uh, figure out different ways that we can be a part of spreading the gospel uh, to the ends of the globe. And missions is the way we do that. And there are so many ministries that we're going to introduce a few of those to you uh, here in just a few minutes. But the faith promise card you got, in, and you just saw the video on giving. And man, so often I think we get locked into this idea that, that the church is just, a, you know, when we talk about giving, oh, they're just trying to get my money and things like that. But man, giving is so critical in terms of advancing ministry and being able to figure out how to support ministries and take the gospel places that we may not be able to physically go and that's what giving is so much about these cards you have in your hand um, we want you to prayerfully consider something we want you to prayerfully consider above and beyond your what you might normally give to the church and the ministries here is what you might desire as an individual or a family to give towards missions in 2020 in the next year and that's what this card's all about there's no pressure no expectation it's just simply an opportunity for you to join us in ministry. And what we do is we put these cards out every November and we ask people to turn them back in and say, you know what, I can do this amount weekly, monthly, or maybe a one-time gift annually even. But this is what I, I would like to give towards missions and all of it goes towards our missionaries, the mission groups we support around the globe. And none of it goes into the church general fund. It all goes out. And, and what it does is it gives us an opportunity to be able to partner with some of the ministries you're going to hear from this morning and to say, we can tell them, look, this is how much we We've had pledged that we expect to be able to support you with this next year and that's what this is all about it just gives us an idea of what we can commit to some of our ministries uh, that we want to support outside of these walls and so you filling out this card and, and, and making a commitment to giving to missions and spreading the gospel uh, beyond this place this is where it starts this is an opportunity for you to join us to partner with some of the people you're going to hear from today and that's what it's all about again no pressure no expectations it's simply between you and God how you might want to be a part of doing that and so I ask today that you take the card you have in your hand spend some time praying over it and maybe you came in here already knowing that yes I want to give and I know what I want to give and you can fill that card out and on your way out today you can drop it in one of the lock boxes uh, maybe you need some time to, to spend considering that and take it and bring it back next week that's fine but we would love to challenge you to consider how you might be a part of that Matt's here Matt uh is uh he, he's been coming to church here with us and he's a member here now and for several months and uh and matt has a heart that is broken for ministry and i've heard him talk about it and, and some of those of the mission team know too and matt i just want you to share your heart uh, for missions and how how god has captured your heart for that good morning well to start off with my passion for missions can be broken down to a, to a verse which is Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All the authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely, 
and surely I am with you to the end of days of every age. This verse can be broken down into four key points. Christ commands us to go, to be bap- to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in doing so to make disciples and remember that he is always with us. From a, from a very young age, my family has ingrained missions into me. My father has been to Africa, Mexico. My mother has been to Haiti. She has been to uh, several South American countries. As for me, I have lived in China for six months. I have taken four mission trips to Haiti. I have been to Hungary, Austria. I have been to Slovakia. And I have been to the Czech Republic. Amongst all of these, my greatest experience, however, comes from my first mission trip to Haiti. I am embarrassed to say this, but before I went on that mission trip to Haiti, I did something you're not supposed to do. I was doubting God, and I challenged him. I challenged him to show me that he was real. And he did in the most miraculous way. I was on the construction team, and we finished construction early, so we went to go and meet the, 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 the clinic team. We got to the clinic area, and we found that they had a one-year-old baby by the name of Samuel. Samuel was dying. And the only thing that could save him was a bone marrow transplant. And the, the, the drug that we need for that operation was nowhere even accessible in Haiti. Shortly after we walked in, the man who, who we were there with, a man named Emmanuel Laguerre, walked in to inform us that the compound was locked down. We were all desperately, we were all desperately praying for a, a, a chance to save Samuel's life. <laughs> and our prayers were answered. Shortly after Emmanuel left, a lady who we had no clue who she was walked up to the door, knocked, and handed mom two of these dr- two bottles of this drug. Looking back now, I understand and know that this was an angel. I wish I had known that earlier. But just in that brief moment is where my, my passion for missions began. In that brief moment, I learned that the reason why we do missions is because people's souls are on the line. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. Yeah. I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to go on a a short or a long-term mission trip, but I can tell you, and I know there are several in this room that can tell you, it changes everything about you uh, because you see that you see places where the gospel is needed and you see what it means when you get to be a part of God using you, like Matt described stories like that. Stories all over the place. They're just unbelievable, and they, and they do. They change you from the inside. I'm going to ask those of you who represent some of the missions we support, if you would come up here uh, for a second. I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourselves today. We have seven, come on up, we have seven um, mission groups represented uh, today, and uh, I just want them to briefly each uh, introduce themselves and uh, tell you just name and ministry. And <laughs> I'm Diane Cross from Mountain Mission in Ladoga. I think most of you know me or know what we do um, unofficially. I get calls uh, to find babysitters, um, to pull people out of ditches, to jumpstart their cars, you name it. People call me, they think I know everything. Don't tell them I don't. Uh, But officially, we do uh, used clothing and furniture and household items and linens and blankets and silverware and we have a food pantry. Uh, We do new school clothes, uh, backpacks and shoes and supplies for kids in July and um, I do a lot of things outside the office that I don't do in the office. I spend a lot of time at Ladoga Elementary School and uh, go to conferences and all kinds of things. So I just want to thank you all for your support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. Well, good morning. Hi, my name is Rob Hughes, and I am a life coach at Trinity Life Ministries. And I just want to thank you for your support, for your prayers and your finances. Because of you, we are able to help men uh, see Jesus and uh, to turn their life around. 
uh, from one end to the other spectrum all the way to the other to where they're serving Christ and they're uh, doing wonderful things uh, for God. And so thank you so much. I don't know if you realize this or not, but over 68,000, over 68,000 people lost their lives last year uh, because they OD'd on drugs. That's not counting um, alcohol. 192,000 people a day die from overdoses. And thanks to you and churches like you, ministries like ours can help a few men uh, stay alive. So you're making a wonderful, wonderful difference. And I just want to introduce you to Donnie Blackford, who's just one of our guys that came through our program. He's about to graduate. And by the way, one more thing, um, our last class that we just graduated, we had over 60% graduate successfully. Can we give God some praise for that? Mm -hmm. Amen. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm Donnie. Um, I just want to thank New Hope. I know a lot of people from here that go and help Trinity out a lot. Um, you guys help a lot of people out. And we've been privileged to go along with some of that and help as, as well. Um, we just want to thank you. I, I used to be an addict. Um, God has totally took all those desires away from me and uh, showed me a brand new way to live. And uh, I just want to thank you again. Sorry. One more thing. Sorry. So we're going to hang around after the service, and if there's anything, if you know somebody or in your family or, or you know somebody, your neighbor or whatever, that is dealing with addictions, um, please come see us. We'd be more than happy to pray with you, more than happy to uh, get you uh, pointed in the right direction. Okay? Thanks. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Millie Trent. I'm here on behalf of Care India or Reach India, if you see the sign outside. Uh, we are stationed in um, Andhra Pradesh, India. Uh, we have a couple different programs. Our main goal is to be able to um, be the hands and feet of Christ um, to everyone in the area, um, hopefully expanding as well. We have a boys and girls um, home that houses about 100 boys and girls. Uh, we have a feed a widow program, which currently supports about 600 widows to give them a meal um, at least once a day. Um, we also have our Save the Girl program that helps girls to go to school in India who aren't as pri um, privileged as we are. Uh, we have about um, 8,500 currently in our Save the Girl program, which is a huge blessing. We also help um, to dig wells in villages who don't have access to clean water or they already have a well and it has been dried up unfortunately with the drought. But in the next month, we are hopefully having 17 wells dug, which is a, another huge blessing. Um, and if you have any other questions, I will also be out in the hallway. Um, thank you so much for having us here and God bless. Hi, I'm Women's, um, Patty Harvey from Women's Resource Center, and um, we're a local crisis pregnancy center. We're a pro-life ministry. Um, we're a Christian ministry. We see about 100 women a month, um, and we provide pregnancy tests. We do ultrasounds. We do life-affirming ultrasounds for girls that are considering abortion, and even if they're not considering abortion, we still do ultrasounds because... Yeah, sometimes they don't tell us the truth. Um, but anyway, so we um, are in our ultrasound room. We have a great big screen TV where we can show them that baby, show them that their baby has a heartbeat, um, show them that it's life. And um, we also are big advocates for adoption. Um, and we have a program where girls can earn baby items, diapers, and, and things like that. We also have the opportunity to share the gospel with them. We had um, 40 girls in the last year give their lives to Christ. So it's a, amazing. And thank you guys so much for all your support and your prayers. Please, um, we're, we're fighting a spiritual battle with uh, abortion. And so please pray for us. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Zoke with Impact Christian Church. You probably know where Gary, Indiana is. We're just next to Gary. And uh, thinking back, uh, New Hope has been a part of our uh, support base, I think, for over 13 years. And uh, we appreciate that deeply. Uh, again, working in the urban community uh, has a lot of challenges on its own. And uh, I spend the rest of the day saying that, but 
Again, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Gary Baker from Hanging Rock, we uh, definitely value our partnership with you here at New Hope. We had one of our best seasons of camp we've ever had in the history of camp. So we had over 2,000 campers, 2,086 campers this summer. Very good. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. I see some of our campers over there. So, uh, you know, we're, we're excited about continuing to do God's work out there. We had over 100 decisions for Christ this summer. So uh, thank you for your partnership. I've got a table out there. I've got some freebies, some carabiner keychains. So come and get one. Talk to me about camp. I've got some great things coming up. Great projects, We're working on getting the bathrooms remodeled, right, campers? So praise the <laughs> Lord for that, right? Uh, and uh, getting our dining hall expanded and all that fun stuff. So thank you, New Hope. Rock on. Thank you, guys. Man, it's so cool to hear about all this stuff and think about it. Uh, what you just heard, just a sampling of when we give to missions, uh, the impact that you're having. Uh, in Montgomery County, uh, around the state of Indiana, uh, we support ministries in other parts of the United States and around the globe. And uh, man, those are places that we may not be able to touch personally, uh, may not have that opportunity, but uh, through what we give, we can, we can share the gospel in some uh, faraway places and some hard places to reach, places that we may not have that opportunity. Thank each of you uh, who are doing that work. Uh, you're an encouragement to us here at New Hope as we see ministry like that happening. And, uh, and we want to do everything we can to partner with you. So thank you guys uh, for doing that. Um, I guess I probably just shouldn't preach, right? <laughs> should go home now. Uh, you know, we were going through this series kind of connected with faith promise, not ashamed. And, uh, and, and we've been looking at this passage out of... Uh, Romans chapter 1, and we'll, I'll pull it up in a minute, but, uh, and we'll take a look at what Paul has to say about not being ashamed of the gospel. Uh, I want to ask you a question, though. Is, is weakness a good thing or a bad thing? Think about it. Is weakness a good thing or a bad thing? If you think, I'll just ask you, let's just vote by a show of hands. If weakness is good, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you think weakness is good. All right? Raise your hand if you think weakness is bad. One, okay. Yeah, we, and it's interesting. We could go around and we could talk about it. And I, I could ask, you know, why is weakness good for those of you who raise your hand? And I don't know, you might say, well, weakness is good because it, 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 uh, it, it exposes where I need to improve and to grow, right? You might say weakness is bad because it's where I fail and where I fall short. And there are several different ways we can answer that question. I think about a, I think about a, a sports athlete or a, a team. You know, if, if they have a weakness... Let's say it's a basketball team and their weakness is they're, they're weak on defense or they're weak free throw shooters. You know, what's going to happen? You know, they're, first of all, their opponent's going to try to exploit that weakness so they can beat them, right? But when they recognize that weakness, what are they going to do? They're going to practice. They're going to seek out coaching and training. They're going to try to strengthen that weakness so that they can't be exploited. If they don't, the results are not going to be very successful. Think about a business leader a company that, that's trying to succeed. What happens if, if that company has a weakness, if, if one of their products is, is not profitable? Uh, if they have an employee that isn't getting the job done, what, what does that business do? If, if that business is being led by good leadership, they address those things, right? They, they address those weaknesses. Why? Because if they don't, the opposition is going to to exploit it. They are not going to be successful, to be able to grow, to be able to, to fulfill whatever it is the mission of that business is. I, I think about uh, even a structure, for instance, like a, let's say there's a dam that's protecting a community from a, a river, right? What happens if that dam has a weakness? An engineer discovers a weakness, What's going to happen? If, if, if that engineer ignores it, what's going to happen? Eventually, it's going, it's going to get progressively worse. It's not just going to stay the same, right? That weakness is going to continue to progress, to get worse, put that community in danger. A good engineer is going to figure out what's going on. Listen, none of us likes weakness, do we? None of us wants to be weak. But you know, I think about it, there, there's no business leader or athlete that wants to be weak and to not address it. There's no engineer that wants what they've built to have a weakness. They're going to address it. They're going to, to face up to it. And that's just the truth. I, I think 
I think the fact that we need to think about is this. In that way, weakness is bad. But, but think about this. Our weaknesses are actually the things that make us stronger. Our weaknesses are the things that force us to acknowledge the fact that we're not perfect. They force us to address those things and to strengthen them. Without weakness, we would never grow, we would never improve, we would never move forward. I think some people might even say that, that pain is a form of weakness, right? You know, think about what pain is. Pain tells you that something is wrong. Pain makes you go to the doctor or to address what's going on. Without pain, you don't address the cause, the weakness, right? I believe, guys, and what I want to talk to you about today just for a minute is that this is true for us spiritually as well. None of us is perfect, right? Would we agree? None of us in this room is perfect. We all have spiritual weakness. We all have temptations that trip us up sometimes. We all have disciplines and, and part of our relationship with God that are weak. We, we all have that, that, that sin or that thing that, that continues to, to draw us away, that draws us towards it. And we all have those kind of weaknesses. We're all spiritually, in our, in our disciplines, we have areas of weakness. Maybe it's your prayer life. Maybe it's, maybe it's in your heart for giving or for serving others. Maybe it's, maybe it's your ability to love certain people or certain attitudes that you carry just to name a, a few, but I wonder how many of us would say that our spiritual weakness is good. Think about that. It would sound kind of silly to say it that way, for, for someone to say, well, uh, my temptation to look at pornography is good. I mean, nobody's going to say that, right? And no one would say the fact that I don't give regularly to the church or to charity, that's a good thing. Nobody's going to say it that way. It sounds ridiculous, but the truth is this. We all have weaknesses, and it is through those weaknesses that God begins to transform us into the followers he's called us to be. And that's why I can stand here today and I can say this. I, I'm not ashamed of my weakness. And I know it sounds strange to say it that way. But, and, I, and I don't want you to misunderstand me. I am not saying that my sin is okay. I'm not saying that I shouldn't be ashamed when I fail God and when I sin against God. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is that it is the areas of my life where I am weak that God does his work. And that's a good thing. Here's a truth I want you to take with you today. One of the biggest obstacles between me and God is my desire to be strong. That's, that, that's just a personal testimony one of my weaknesses one of the biggest obstacles between me and God is is my desire to be strong if I'm convinced that I'm that I am strong that I can do it on my own that I can handle it then what do I need a savior for I will never turn to God when I'm convinced that I'm fine just like I am now to Romans 1 16 this is what Paul says for I am not ashamed of the gospel he says because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And I want you to think about what Paul's saying there. And we've talked about this the last few weeks. I am not ashamed of the gospel. What is the gospel? The, go the word gospel means good news. What's the good news Paul's talking about? What's included in the gospel? A couple weeks ago, we talked about how the gospel means that I am a child of God. I get to be adopted as a child of God when I turn my life towards him. I get, that's good news. That's gospel. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the fact that I'm a child of God. That's gospel. The second thing, last week we talked about the word of God. I am not ashamed of God's word. Now, a lot of people in our culture will say, well, the, the Bible's outdated. The standards found in it are, are ridiculous. It makes you narrow-minded. It makes you judgmental. It, it makes you old-fashioned in the eyes of our culture. And I'm telling you, when, when we look at the word of God, we understand it's not just a book. The word... The Word in the beginning was God and was with God, and the Word came and made its dwelling among us. The Word was Jesus. The book that we have is His story, and it never changes. And I'm not ashamed of it, even if the culture tells me I should be. And I think that's what Paul's saying. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the Word of God. And today, I want us to talk about a third aspect of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of my weakness. And I'll show you where Paul talks about that here 
in just a few minutes, but that's where we're starting. And I want to start off with this because I, I think I, 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 want you to, I want you to think about this. What is it in that passage? It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone. Think about the thing that it is that brings salvation. The power of God. We need His power. Why? Because we're weak. We can't save ourselves. And the fact that God has given us the chance for salvation through Jesus is very good news. Being able to recognize my weakness opens the door of my heart to the power and strength of God. And that's how weakness can be good. Now, there's a passage uh, in Matthew chapter 5. It starts the Sermon on the Mount. It's the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. It's a section called the Beatitudes. And I've shared this with you before, but if you haven't heard it, I just want to put this in front of you. And it's just the very beginning of it. It says, now when, the, uh, the, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside. He sat down and his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And what does that mean? Blessed is the poor in spirit, for there's a king. There's a guy named Eugene Peterson, passed away a few years ago, but he wrote uh, a paraphrase of scripture uh, called The Message. And he was attempting to capture um, the, the Bible in our language, the way we speak, our vernacular, if you will, today. And, uh, and, and I wouldn't ever recommend you use The Message as your primary source for study and studying scripture, but sometimes I think he does a really good job of helping us understand. Go ahead and, and go to the next screen. I want you to look at this same passage, the beginning of the Beatitudes in The Message. It says, when Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and he taught his climbing companions, and this is what he said, first beatitude. You are blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God in his rule. Now, I think that's a beautiful way to capture that beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you reach the end of your rope, because that's when you decrease and he increases. That's when he gets to take over. You want to know why weakness is good? Weakness is good because we acknowledge that there's someone bigger and better than us. That there's a place where we can turn when we can't do it ourselves. That's important. That's critical. That's that's what we need. And that's what today is all about. Today, my big question for you is this. I want you to think about that. When you reach the end of your rope, that's when he takes over. I want you to think about this. What parts of your life or off limits to God because you don't need him. What parts of your life? And I know none of us are probably going to say, well, no, God has everything. I want you to be honest with yourself. What parts of your life are off limits to God because you don't think you need him? Because you're strong enough and you can handle it yourself. Is it your finances? Is it some of your relationships in your life? What, what is it? What is it that you're hanging on to saying, I'm strong here. I don't need a savior. I'm good enough here talk to somebody else we have to start there if we want jesus to transform us into the disciple he's called us to be that's why weakness is good when we can say i can't do this on my own and yes i do need him today i just want to give you five quick things what happens when when i when i say i am not ashamed of my weakness why is that I am not ashamed of my weakness. I want to give you five reasons why I'm not ashamed of my weakness. The first one is this. Weakness makes me aware. How many of you are familiar with Peter's story? The apostle, right? He's following Jesus around for three years. He was learning. Jesus even said, Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. He's he's kind of designating Peter. You're going to be the guy that's the leader, the guy that kind of starts this movement. And Peter's just, Peter at that moment was not ready to hear that. He was not ready to live it out anyway. Jesus goes on and tells Peter, Peter, on that last night before Jesus was arrested, getting ready to go and and be crucified, Jesus tells Peter, before this night's over, you're going to deny even knowing me three times. Peter says, no, never happen. Not going to happen. I'm strong. I am not that weak. But we see in Matthew chapter 26, Peter has already, and that night Jesus has been arrested, he's on on trial, and people are starting to try to figure out who are the guys that was with him. And Peter's already been asked twice. 
You were one of them, right? No, not me. Look at how it ends. It says, in a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. And he began to call down curses, and he swore at them. I don't know the man, he says. Go ahead, next one. Boom. Immediately, the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. This had to happen for Peter to become the guy Jesus called him to be. His weakness had to be exposed. He had to become aware. Think about it. When when I am not ashamed of my weakness, I become aware of it. And that's when God can start working. Something else that happens when I'm willing to, when I, when I know that I'm not ashamed of my weakness. I am not ashamed of my weakness because weakness causes me to listen. Now, in, back in the Old Testament, 1 Kings, chapters 18 and 19, story about a man named Elijah. And I'll just briefly tell you this, is, is Elijah was a prophet of God at a time when uh, King Ahab, Queen Jezebel, evil leaders in Israel were killing, or trying to wipe out God. They were trying to promote their own religion the, and, and, and uh, promote the God called Baal. And they, were, they had all their own prophets uh, promoting Baal, and they were trying to wipe out anyone who claimed the name of God. And they had killed off all the prophets of God. Now, Elijah was the last one. And Elijah talks, of the, there's a story in there about Elijah challenging the prophets of Baal. Let's see who the real God is. And they say, if you're God, why don't you call your God to send down fire from heaven onto your altar, and I'll call down my God to send down fire. And let's see which one shows up. And the cool thing was, obviously their false God could do nothing and did nothing, and Elijah's God showed up. And Elijah was thinking, man, finally a victory. That's not how it worked out afterwards. Elijah was thinking, I'm going to finally some relief. But that's not what happened. Ahab and Jezebel committed to making sure he was dead in the next 24 hours. And he takes off and he flees into the wilderness. And for the next 40 days, he's on the run for his life. He's exhausted. He feels abandoned. He hasn't, he, he's not hearing from God. He's saying, I'm doing everything God's called me to do. I'm trying to be the man he's called me to be. I've even been a part of seeing something amazing happen. And here I am being threatened with my life. I'm on the run. I'm hungry. And I, I'm tired of it. And he sit, says he sat down and he just wanted to die. He prayed, God, just kill me now if this is how it's going to be. I wonder how many of us have felt that way before. And, and, and God, that's when God finally shows up. He's on this, in this cave on the side of a mountain. And I want you to look at what it says in the scripture here. It says, and the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. <clears throat> Next. <laughs> Come on, Hannah, you can do it. I, I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, and the Lord was not in the wind. But after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And this is when he finally happens. It says, after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Now here's the thing. And God went on to speak to him and to say, Elijah, this is what's gonna happen next. This is how I'm with you. This is how your ministry matters. This is how, this is how you're going to impact the world around you through being faithful even when you're weak. I'm going to take over. You see, God had to get to Elijah to a place that he was ready to listen. His weakness brought him to a place that he was finally ready to listen. The third thing, when I am not ashamed of my weakness that happens is this. Weakness forces me to trust. I love the story in Judges chapter 6 and 7, the story of Gideon, another Old Testament story. And this is such a cool story. If you don't know anything about it, it simply is this. Gideon was a man, a judge of the Israelites, and they were trying to put this army together to face the Midianites. And it says the Midianites were over in the other valley, and there were more of them than you could count. 
And all, uh, and all he could get together, all Gideon could get together was about 33,000 fighters. And, he, and it, was, it felt like, man, the odds are so much against us. With all these Midian, there's no way we can fight it. But God said, I don't think this is the army I want to work with. And he starts winnowing out and telling Gideon to send people home. And he gets it down to where the army was only 300 people, 300 men, to stand up against the Midianites that couldn't even be counted. And, and Gideon is looking at it going, what in the world? You've taken this from being very long odds to being completely impossible. And God says, that's the point. He wanted him to trust. My weakness forces me to trust God. My weakness takes me from a place where I feel like the odds are against me to a place where I feel like it's just impossible. And the only way it's going to happen is if God shows up. And that's exactly what he wants. Sometimes in your life you're praying, God, please take my weakness away. Take my struggle away. Take my sin away. And God's saying, that is exactly not what I'm going to do because that is where you're going to begin trusting me and that's where you're going to find me. God doesn't want our odds to be long. He wants our odds to be impossible when we find him working for us. That's what happens when I discover my weakness and realize I just can't do it. I can't. As a, as a, a minister in the church, I can't grow this church. I can't, I can't reach this community for Christ. That's going to be God showing up and using all of us, right? We can't... We can't reach and spread the gospel around the globe. We can't do that. We need our ministry partners to do it. We've got to support them. The odds aren't just long. They're impossible if we don't have him. The next thing that happens when I acknowledge that I am not ashamed of my weaknesses, weakness helps me to depend on God. You know the story of Samson, right? Just a few chapters later in Judges chapter 16. Samson's strong. The source of his strength is his hair. And Delilah comes along to tempt him. Because Delilah wanted to take him down along with the Philistines, these people fighting against the Israelites. But there's Samson all strong and he finally gives in. Because, I mean, who's not going to give in to a woman when she wants something, right? I mean, and she, and she, and she does. She gets him to, she gets him to re- reveal the source of his strength, cuts his hair. He's weak now and he's taken into, into, into custody by the Philistines. Samson, up to this point, did nothing in his life but depend on his strength. And now he realizes in his weakness that he has to depend on God. There's this one last moment where his eyes have been gouged out and he's being held prisoner by the Philistines and he calls out to God, God, I need you to give me the strength to take these people out, and I will. And he did. But it took his weakness to show him how to depend on God. And the last thing I want to give you, and this is where Paul speaks, The last thing I want to give you that happens and the reason that I am not ashamed of my weakness is it allows me to be strong. My weakness allows me to be strong. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 5 through 10. I want to read this to you and I want you to look. This is the same guy who said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed. It is the power of God that brings salvation. He says this, I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. If I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I'd be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations. What Paul's doing is acknowledging the fact that, yeah, I've got a lot going for me. I've done a lot of things for the gospel. I've done a lot of things for the church and for God, and he's used me in a lot of great ways. But I'm going to talk for a minute about my weaknesses. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, from depending on my own strength and my own power, is what he's saying. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Do you see what Paul's getting at here? Do you see why this is a part of the gospel he's not ashamed of? I am not ashamed of the gospel. Part of the good news is the fact that I am weak 
Not that I enjoy my failure and sin and weakness, but that I know that is where God's going to show up and do things that I could never even imagine doing. And that's a good thing. The one word that keeps coming to my mind is the word submission. Submission to someone else is the ultimate form of weakness, right? That's exactly what it takes to be saved from our own rebellion and sin. Think about it. Our rebellion and sin against God is us simply saying, and our default, the way we tend to live our life every day, is that I am strong enough to do this on my own. I do not need you, God. I am doing it my way. But submission is us coming before God and saying, God, I'm weak. I can't do this without you. I want you to save me and make me your child and let me spend eternity with you. And guys, the fact that God answers that prayer when we come to him is very good news. You see, for Jesus to be your Savior, he must first be your Lord. And that's good news. That's weakness. And that is very good news. I am not ashamed of my weakness, just like Paul was not ashamed of his. Because our weakness is is where transformation takes place. It is where the power of God takes over. It is where salvation becomes possible. And that is the gospel. That is good news. And so I guess today I'm simply putting in front of you this question. Are you a child of God? Are you willing to stand on his word? And are you willing to embrace your weakness and submit to him so that his power can take over. That's what it means when we say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Today we're going to share in a time of communion together. An opportunity for us to reflect on what this means. When the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that was Jesus coming and saying, I'm going to come and do my work now. My power is going to take over. He went to the cross and he took he took on the wrath of God for us so that we could be called his children, so that we could have his story, his word, and so that in our weakness we could be made strong. That's what communion's about, is remembering that it took Jesus, the word, coming here and taking that on for us. We could not do it on our own. Let's spend some time praising him for that, remembering what he did to give us the opportunity to be called his children. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the church. Thank you for all the stories we see throughout Scripture and all the stories we saw represented on the stage earlier about what it means to not be ashamed of the gospel. Our identities as your children, your word, and, and our weakness, God. And I pray that right now as we spend this time reflecting on your son Jesus and what he did for us, God, that we can remember that broken body, that blood poured out, calling us into your story as children, calling us to take our weakness, to give it to you, so you can make it strong. Thank you, God, for those things. Let us remember them now in Jesus' name. Amen.
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Today we, uh, before we leave this place, we want to, give you an opportunity to respond. Maybe uh, maybe you've never given, submitted yourself to Jesus as the Lord of your life, and, and you want to know how to do that. Mike will be down front. We have a couple of our elders in the back who would love to have that conversation with you to help you start that journey, to know the steps that, that you can take to make Jesus Lord of your life. Maybe you need a church family, and we'd love to welcome you with open arms here at New Hope. You can come talk to Mike about that, or maybe you just would like to have somebody to pray with about a weakness, a struggle that you're fighting. No matter what it is you need to do, how you need to respond today, just don't leave here the same way you came in. Let's stand together. Let's sing this song I know is one you're all familiar with. Let's lift this up in praise to God, and you respond how you need to today.
Oh, thank you for being here this morning and worshiping with us. Um, don't forget, there is a fellowship meal after service. It'll be down there in the FLC, but you'll still have plenty of time to check out our uh, missionaries booths out back. If you'd brought ties and offerings with you um, this morning, you can drop those off in the lock boxes in the back of the sanctuary. You can also give online. Um, oh, connect cards. You thought I'd forget about that. You can fill out your connect cards digitally or use the paper uh, form. If you will text card to that number that's on the screen, um, you'll get a series of texts back. Just um, follow the instructions, super easy. Took me all of uh, 10 seconds to get that done today. Um, also, if you're a first time guest, you can text welcome to the same uh, number there and follow those uh, prompts as well. And before we close out with one more song, let's close with prayer. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for our missionaries that, that travel, that are out there, Lord, that are being bold. Um, we pray that uh, you continue to give them boldness, give them strength, and just uh, we lift them up to you, Lord. Lord, as far as we go, uh, our personal journey, help us to be bold within our house, within our street, within our block, in this county, Lord, just to not be ashamed of the gospel and present that um, with love and um, being gentle. We love you and we praise you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to go out here worshiping and not being ashamed. Don't be afraid to fight your hand, too. This song kind of requires a three of it. Like